Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let us turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. We would like for you to follow along with us as we study God's Word verse by verse. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. We're going to read from verses 47 to 56. 47 to 56. Matthew writes, And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one sees him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it, might, that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitude, have you come out against me, a robber with swords and club to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. The last time we were together, um, we have looked at Matthew chapter 26. We looked at verses 31 to 46. In verses 31 to 35, Jesus predicted Peter's denial. After Jesus said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, he said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock would be scattered. Jesus even quote a prophetic passage quoting from the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 13 verse 7, and predicting how they all will scatter at his arrest, and they will scatter at his crucifixion. Then Peter, of course, Peter have to speak. Peter said to Jesus, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. In other words, what Peter was saying is, I don't know about all these guys, Jesus. I don't know about Matthew. You can't trust him. He's a tax collector. Thomas is always doubting, I don't know about these guys, but me, I will never be made to stumble. Peter, obviously, he was filled with pride. He had a, a comparative spirit comparing himself to be more spiritual, more spiritually strong, stronger than all the other disciples. Have We see that in church. We see that quite often. Hopefully, that's not you. Calvary Chapel doesn't do that. Other churches do, but not, not just kidding. <laughs> we all, right? Instead, Peter, instead of Peter humbling himself, listening to the words of Jesus, when Jesus speaks, it's truth, it is prophetic, it is going to happen. Uh, Peter still, he continued on. Jesus said, I surely I say to you, now he's speaking directly to Peter. You, you want attention, you're going to get it. And he says to Peter, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And I believe that's when Jesus again went at the end of the, at the, end of God, the gospel of John, Jesus asked Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times. Peter, instead of humbling himself, he continued on. He says, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And of course, after Peter said that, all the disciples say, yeah, I'm chiming in. Yeah, I, me too. I'll die with you, Jesus. We'll see that it's going to turn out, as Jesus said, 
it would turn out. And so in verses 36 to 46, Jesus, we saw Jesus pray to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, made, as he makes his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, he now uh, has the disciples at a certain distance, and now he, he just selects these three, Peter, James, and John, because they always get in trouble, that's why, not because they are holier than the others. In verse 38, he says, he tells them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death, even to death. Jesus makes his way uh, to the garden. He falls, he falls on his face to the ground, praying to the Father. Um, the other gospel tells us, Luke tells us he was in agony and he was even sweating uh, drops of blood. And Luke is a physician, he's a doctor, and I, I, I believe what he's saying. And the reason Jesus was in agony and in anguish, the reason he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death was not so much that he was suffered the most brutal beating, excruciating beating on the cross, or the fact that he would take in the nails of his hand, but I think most importantly was the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, for the very first time would be separated from his Father. Never been done, never been done. And it was our sins, as we looked at our study last time, it's our sins, the sins of the world, your sins and my sin, that we have separated the Son and the Father almost 2,000 years ago. Never been done. And so Jesus prayed. He prayed, oh, my Father, is it possible? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And we need to learn that prayer. We always want things our way. It's your will. He went the second time and said, oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And Matthew tells us that he goes the third time and after trying to wake up the disciples, they were sleeping, he goes for the third time and, and gives the same prayer. And what Jesus is praying in this prayer, knowing one thing that he's going to be separated from his father, but his prayer was that, Father, is there any other way, any other way by which ungodly sinners can be saved by going to the cross? And you notice that out of the four Gospels, God did not answer. It wasn't that God was ignoring his prayer, but the reality is there is no other way. And so Jesus had to go on the cross. The only way for man to be right with God, to have eternal life, is not by works. It's not by what religion you are a part of. It is by the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. And that was by way of review. Now that brings us to verses 47 to 56. And we're going to see the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. And so let us look at our text this morning, verse by verse. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. Let's look at verse 47. It says, And while he, speaking of Jesus, was still speaking, back and forth in verse 46, just look up to the next verse, 46. Jesus had just finished praying to the Father, and he tells his disciple, Rise, let us go, let us be going, because my betrayer is at hand. In other words, look. My betrayer is here, and obviously Jesus, Jesus knows all things. This is of no surprise to him, but obviously uh, the disciples were sleeping. They weren't alert. They weren't awake. They weren't praying. They weren't watching, and Jesus had to do that. And let me tell you, if God wakes you up in the middle of the night, you can't sleep, and you've done everything. You take your melatonin, and you took your cup of tea. There is a reason God is calling you to pray and just pray. But he said, look, my betrayer is here. And as soon as Jesus has finished those words, it says, behold, Judas, he's the betrayer. Behold, Judas, one of the 12 with a great multitude with swords and clubs came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And just as Jesus predicted, just as it was prophesied, Almost a thousand years from this time, the date that Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, almost a thousand years back, it was prophesied that Jesus would be betrayed by a friend. Over 300 messianic prophecies, whenever you see anything in the Gospels, you'll find that it'll be confirmed and is consistent with the Old Testament. About a thousand years, the psalmist, the prophet David prophesied this, and he writes in Psalms 41 verse 9, he writes this, 
Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. It was prophesied that Jesus would be portrayed by a friend, one who he, he trusts, one that ate his bread. Now the, the application, interpretation is obviously bread, but it could also apply not so much the bread from the table in which Jesus dipped in the sauce and gave to Judas, but also Jesus is what? The bread of life. He is the word. He is the spiritual food that we eat, the spiritual bread that doesn't perish. And so the betrayal was also prophesied 500 years later after David prophesied this. It was prophesied by Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, it says, Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, if not refrain. So they weighed out from my wages 30 pieces of silver. That was the price of a slave. Now, some people say, well, some translations in the Old Testament says 20, but it, it was always 20, actually. But it's amazing that Zechariah says 30. And he's kind of including inflation from the time it was spoken of in the Old Testament. But here, we see that's exactly the amount in which Judas betrayed Jesus was 30 pieces of silver. Now, here Judas comes in, he comes in with a, a, a great multitude, having swords and clubs came uh, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. In the parallel gospel, in the gospel of John, chapter 18, John tells us that Judas came with a detachment of troops, a detachment of troops. The word detachment in the Greek is spira, which is, trans, which is translated a cohort. In some, in some of you, your translations, you have cohort. That's actually, in, it comes also from the Latin word. A detachment, a cohort of troops of, an ancient, of the ancient Roman army was a tenth of a legion. One tenth of a legion. What is a legion? 6,000 troops. One legion in the Roman army is considered 6,000 troops, so a tenth of that is 600. 600 Roman soldiers came with Judas to arrest Jesus. This multitude with clubs and, and swords were not only made up of Roman soldiers, but also the officers of the temple, the temple guards, or they're known also as servants. And you find this practice have been taking place even in the Old Testament in Chronicles. Uh, you find that the servants, they were also guards, they were, they were officers. The temple officers were granted under Roman law, they were granted limited police powers by Rome for matters concerning religious um, Jewish religion and society. So they only had limited powers, but it was only within their religion and in, their, in the temple. Now, sometimes people, you know, and I don't know if you see the Jesus movies that you have the Roman soldiers, they're all buffed out, you know, with their armor. And then you got, you got the temple guards, you know, they look like the mall cops, you know, they, they're out of way and everything. But, you know, that is not the truth. That is not the truth. You know, you have to consider, you know, that only one can look at the history of Israel to find out that these men, Israel were always winning victories. Well, obvious because of God. But, you know, these guys were highly skilled, highly trained, buffed out guys as well. They're not going to get some 60-year-old guy or 70-year-old guy. They're going to get, you know, the best fit guys. These guys weren't weak. So don't think that, okay, you have them and, oh, yeah, those guys are just coming along. No, these guys were ready. Now, if you include the 600 Roman soldiers uh, and uh, the uh, temple guards and the Pharisees were there, the, the, the Sanhedrin were there, the gospel tells us, you know, many scholars have put the number at least of a thousand men. Anywhere from, we could probably, you know, conservatively say that it's 700. You, you know, you, I don't know how many, uh, you know, temple guards were with him or the Pharisees. They, they're, they're about 70, the whole Sanhedrin. Right? That's where 70, the word 70 comes from. But many scholars believe it was about a thousand men. And think about a thousand men coming after Jesus. Now you know Jesus, but they know Jesus too. They just hated Jesus, not because of anything he did wrong, but because he wasn't with them. Just think, 
the son of God, Jesus Christ, who broke neither messianic nor Roman law. He committed no immoral or illegal act. The scripture says he was without sin. He was daily in the temple. We're going to see that. His only offense was that he was not following or obeying the man-made tradition by the legalistic Pharisees. They've added to the law. That's why Jesus didn't obey their law. Jesus is not going to obey any man-made laws. He's going to obey the word of God. And so should we as well. And so you see Judas with almost a thousand men, they, they, they leave Jerusalem, they cross over the Kidron Valley, they make their way into the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. Question yourself, I don't know, why so many soldiers? Why so many men? I believe it's because of the religious leaders. And also, the Roman authorities, they were anticipating, if they arrest Jesus, they were anticipating an uprising. I tell you why. You, you remember, not too long ago, we were talking about a Thursday, and just four days ago, Jesus rode into Jerusalem. You remember, we're still in that Passion Week. We're still in that uh, Passover week. On Palm Sunday, which why we call it Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem just four days ago. And what happened when he rode in, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah, that he would come riding into a donkey, specifically said a donkey, not a horse, because if a man were to ride into a village in a horse, that is a threat to any village. When you go into a village, you're not of that village. You dismount yourself from the horse and you walk with the horse, but Jesus come riding in a donkey. And what happened when Jesus rode into Jerusalem? Josephus, the historian, tells us there was two and a half million worshipers there with their lambs. And they all shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a messianic praise. It's a messianic calling to the Messiah. And what they were saying, the, 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 um, the Roman guards, they knew this. The soldiers, they knew this because the soldiers were there to secure and make sure there's peace. Hopefully that these Jews don't come and, and now go against Rome. So they're there policing for one reason, because they want to have control of Jerusalem. The Pharisees are there. They hear exactly what the crowd is crying out. They know about this messianic prophecy. And their curls are going crazy, because you can't say this is not the Messiah. So both the religious leaders and the Jewish authorities are already realized that Jesus is loved, he's appreciated, he's been accepted. And I believe also the reason why the religious leaders were there is because they wanted to see a sign. How many times they asked Jesus, you're the son of God, give us a sign. We don't believe you. We want to see a sign. It's just like the world today. You know, they got to see proof that there's a God. God doesn't prove anything to you. Romans chapter 1 says, all the creation testifies of his glory. They always worry about the man in the jungle. How does he hear the gospel? Well, the Bible says that they could see that there is a God by looking at creation. But they always wanted a sign from Jesus. And Jesus knows the heart. I'm not going to give you a sign. See, see, when it comes to God, it's not seen as believing. Believing is seen. You all believe in Jesus Christ, don't you? Were you there at the cross? No. Were you there when he left the tomb? No. Faith. Faith. But let me tell you something. Sometimes you may think, well, I wish I was believing in Jesus back then. I wish I was with him. You know what? With Jesus, old Downey Thomas, and I love this. That's why I love the disciples. All that mess up just brings out the words of Christ. Thomas say, well, um, until I see him, then until I put my hand in his wound and his side, then I'll believe. And Jesus shows a poof. Glorified body. They didn't go through it. Their doors were nailed up. Their windows were nailed up. They were afraid. And you know what Jesus told Thomas? He said, you believe because you see, but blessed are those, each and every one of you, who have not seen and believe. So your belief, our belief, is critical to our faith, to believe in Jesus Christ. 
So they always constantly ask for a sign, but Jesus, in Matthew chapter 13, verses 38 to 39, it says, then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Prove who you say you are. But Jesus answered, said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeking after a sign and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What does that mean? As, as Jonah went into the belly of the, world, of the earth, so Christ would go into the grave and he would rise again. That's all. Go back to the book of Jonah, guys. You want a sign? Go to, your, go to the Tanakh and read it. Or they were probably hoping that Jesus and his disciples would resist the rest. That way they say, well, you know what? They arrested Jesus. He fought Rome. And figured, yeah, okay, we're off the hook. But they were there to be witnesses. The reality is no man, no army, nothing, nothing will be able to stop Jesus from going to the cross. Not even a thousand men. But you know what? I think it's important before we leave verse 47. I think this is something that, that just really stands out. And I hope that you could probably, um, you know, get something out of this. I think it's, it's, it's amazing. It just blew me away. But you can miss this quite often. When Matthew, how Matthew described Judas. It's how Matthew described Judas. Matthew writes, behold Judas, one of the 12. In fact, this description of Judas is, uh, of one of the 12 is mentioned eight times in the New Testament. Eight times. And all eight times are found in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because the writers all describe Judas as one of the 12. Matthew quotes it here and in verse 26. Verse 14, Mark in his gospel in chapter 14, verses 10, 20, and 30. I'm sorry, 43. Luke described Judas as one of the 12 in Luke chapter 22, 47. John described Judas as one of the 12 in John chapter 6, verse 71, and John chapter 20, verse 24. They all identified Judas as one of the 12. Now you may ask, Pastor Eddie, why is that so important? Let's just get to the application here. Let's move on. No, I think there's an application in this. Is this, is, this is important because I know, I know. If I had to describe and identify Judas, I would definitely not identify him as one of the 12. If I were to describe Judas, I would have written, Behold Judas, that rotten, no good, double-crossing, backstabbing traitor. That would be my BC days, guys. My before Christ time. But I think this is beautiful in so many ways. First of all, there is proof that the gospel writers, the Bible that you hold in your lap right now, was truly inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did not allow Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to describe Judas in any other way, and they were consistent. They didn't have a meaning to say, hey, listen, you're gonna write, your, hey, Matthew, you're gonna write your gospel? Yeah, I don't know, Luke, you're gonna write yours? Yeah, when we get to Judas, let's just, you know, let's just be nice, okay? No, they didn't get together, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. But they all described Judas as one of the 12. Now, if you remember, we looked at the, the meaning of Judas. The name means praise. That's what Judas means. It means trade. Initially, that's what it meant. However, as the, by the time the gospel was written, his name has long been a byword uh, among Christians, uh, um, and, and it, was, it, it was associated with treachery and infamy. Anybody named their kids Judas? I don't think so. And I think this is a lesson for all of us because the gospel writers, they did not speak evil. They did not change his name. They did not badmouth him. But they identify him as Judas, his name, one of the 12. And I think so too as Christians, we ought to learn about this, not to badmouth and speak negative about anybody. And there's scripture for that. 
James chapter four, verse 11 to 12, in the New Living Translation, I'll give it to you, that version. It says, he said, don't speak evil against each other. Dear brothers and sisters, he's speaking to the believers, not, not unbelievers. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge. We have a hard time understanding that. Whether it applies to you, God alone will, who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? We should speak evil of no one in the church. And let me tell you, I know what it is when people speak evil about me. It just went up when I became a pastor. I couldn't believe it. Because you're there, every, always something negative. He's this, why does he do this? Well, it is always bad mouth, negative, and you know, and they all have the answers, but they never tell me. <laughs> they never tell me. Oh, tell me, you, you got it better? Hey, come up here and do it. <laughs> you know, I gladly give you my position. But it's not only, you know, brothers and sisters, we need to love and encourage one, not speak negative about anyone. But that also applies for speaking negative to those who are not in the church. Paul tells Titus in chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to what? All men. That's in and out of the church. So saints, listen, you and I, all of us, we're to speak evil of no one. And, you know, I fail in that, to be honest. I like to be transparent because I ain't perfect. And it comes to the politicians. <laughs> I mean, you could easily find something on them. But you know what? That's what, you know, Peter says, pray for them. Paul says, pray for them. And we fail, we you know, we fail in that area, don't we? But I think it's important. When you look at verse 47 and you come across this, the, the gospel writers, it's amazing how they did not badmouth Judas. Back to Matthew 26. Let's look at verse 48. Judah's there. You know, he's a multitude of men. They're ready to arrest Jesus. In verse 48, it says, Now his betrayer, speaking of Judas, had given them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one sees him. Jesus would not give them a sign. The Pharisees and the, and the scribes, they've been asking Jesus for a sign, his whole uh, earthly ministry. However, Judas is the one that gives a sign, but it's not the sign that they really desperately need. They need a sign. They need to know that he was of God. But here they have a sign of betrayal, and it comes from Judas. That's the sign that they will get. Judas' sign of a kiss was not for the Pharisees or the scribes or the temple guards because they knew who Jesus was. They could identify Jesus. They saw Jesus heal the sick. They saw Jesus turn the tables of the money changers twice at the temple. They were upset about that. They lost a lot of money. They saw Jesus triumphantly enter into Jerusalem. So they know who he is. They know perfectly well. As a matter of fact, drop down to verse 56. Look at verse 56. At the very end of verse 56, it says, Jesus says, I sat daily, not once a week. I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. So they knew who Jesus was. I believe it was not so much for the religious leaders, but to, so that the uh, Roman soldiers and those that are with them can identify who he is. Because Rome didn't care. They just wanted to make sure you guys are not going to get out of hand and take over, uh, take over Jerusalem. We're in, we're in control. We, Rome governs Jerusalem. That's all they care about. They don't care about the religious and prophecies. They don't care about that. So now in verse 49, it says, Immediately he, speaking of Judas, went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. The only disciple that addressed Jesus as rabbi was Judas. You remember when Jesus says, one of you will betray me, right? All the disciples said, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it me? Lord, is it any? Lord, who is it? 
Judas was the only one, though he knew, but he didn't know that Jesus knew. Judas was the only one that says, Rabbi. He didn't identify him as Lord. He said, Rabbi, is it I? And here he continues to identify him as Rabbi, not Lord. The other gospel says as soon as he left the table to complete the deal, as soon as he left the table, it says Satan had already entered into Judas. Now the greeting that Judas gave to Jesus, the greeting um, is in the Greek, is the word hiero, which means to rejoice, I'm glad to see you. Just a simple, hey, how you doing? You know, it's, that's all it was. Was Jesus, I mean, was Judas really glad to see Jesus? Or he was just glad to complete the transaction of making a profit of 30 pieces of silver? And so he greeted Jesus with a kiss. In those days, it was customary. In the Middle East, it still is. And some parts in Europe. But in those days, it, it was always, you know, there was a custom that they really followed through. They kissed, you know, one another as a greeting but, you know, in those days, in Jesus' day, uh, they had other rabbis. There were other rabbis with their disciples. So Jesus is considered, he, he's the rabbi. He is the rabbi. And the uh, disciples will kiss their rabbi. They will kiss their teacher. And it's a sign of respect, a sign of devotion, a sign of affection, a sign of obedience. That's what a kiss meant from a disciple when he kissed his rabbi. However, in the Greek here, the Greek in the verb, um, even though we knew that his kiss was nothing but, you know, but betrayal, it wasn't affection, it wasn't respect, it wasn't devotion. It's amazing. The Greek word for, the, for kiss here is a continual, repeatedly a kiss, a constantly kissing him. And we see that when you see the same word when Jesus gave the parable, the par prodigal and the son. When the prodigal came back home and the father ran and he kissed him and kissed him. That's the kind of kiss. However, we know that his kiss was anything but respect, obedience, devotion. See, God knows the motive. God knows the motive. And we even could display so much spirituality, whatever it is, you may, you know, have all the right words to say, you may have all the, the Christianese, the lingo, and uh, you may do all the right things, and, you know, but God knows the motive. You know, I remember I was listening to an old school preacher, David Wilkerson, he passed away years ago, but there was a sermon that he gave, I listened to a while ago, and he was just talking to a group of pastors, and it, I'm telling you, man, it just really convicted me. Well, in some of those parts, but there was one part that he said, he says, why God is not giving you the ministry you want? What is your motive? <laughs> Lord, I want to be a teacher. <laughs> What's your motive? Lord, I want to be a pastor. What's your motive? I want to be an elder. What's your motive? Is your motive that you want to be known? <laughs> or when we give and we do things unto the Lord, do we do it to be seen by the others? You see, God knows the motive here. God knows the motive it was a kiss, it was a greeting, but Christ knew the motive. Now, after Judas gave Jesus a greeting and a kiss, in verse 50 it says, but Jesus said to him, speaking to Judas, friend, why have you come? Friend, why have you come? Now there are a lot of commentators who would take this by Jesus calling uh, Judas' friend, they will, they will take this and give the application. You see, Jesus was still a friend to him. And yes, yeah, that's all good. But I don't think that's what Jesus is calling him here. And that's why it's so important, students, to look at the Greek and the Hebrew because you'll find out the difference, what kind of friend Jesus is calling him. In John chapter 15, verses 13 to 14, we find Jesus describing those whom are his friends. In John chapter 15, verses 13 to 14, it says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command. 
The word friend here is the Greek word philos, which means a, a friend that is well regarded, a friend regarded with affection, a friend you can trust, a friend that you actually consider as a family, like a brother, not an acquaintance. However, here in verse 50, the word friend Jesus called Judas was the, is the Greek word heta tyros, which is translated an acquaintance. Remember, Christ never treated, while Judas was with Christ, he never treated him any different. He treated him just like all the others. When he left the table, it says Satan entered into him. Jesus already knows the motive. At this point, Jesus did not consider him friend. The prophecy of Psalm 41 we just read spoke of the, he would be betrayed by a friend. At that moment, yes, Jesus considered him and treated him as a friend he could trust. But he broke that. He's there with a multitude of people. Jesus says, you are my friend. And this is important for us to understand this. You are my friend if you do whatever I command you. Can you say you have a good friendship with your Lord and Savior? You do whatever he has taught you, the word, everything we've learned in scripture. Are we applying that or we're just playing it on Sunday? Or we only, you know, shed light and with salt and light among Christians and not with others. They need to see Jesus the commandment is to share the gospel. Go forth and share the gospel to all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. To love as I love. And we're following that commandment. Then you're considered a good friend. And God knows the heart. If we fail, hey, we have the Holy Spirit. He knows. God knows the motive. Listen, we serve an awesome Savior. He knows you. Friend, why have you come? Now let's look at the question. And that's what friend means. He's not, a pro, he's not addressing him as a close friend once upon a time. But now the question is, if Jesus already knew Judas was going to betray him, if Jesus already knew that, G, that Judas was going to find him in the Garden of, of Gethsemane, if Jesus already knew that, that Judas was coming with the army, why would Jesus ask the question, friend, why have you come? Why are you coming? Why have you come? Luke tells us in Luke chapter 22, verse 48, he says, Jesus asked Judas this, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? These are questions. You see, the question is not so much for Jesus to know. Jesus knows all things. The question is not for Jesus. The question is for Judas. Judas needed this question. Jesus asked Judas, and the reason why he asked Judas this question is to give Judas an opportunity to repent and change his mind and what he's doing. That is the reason why Jesus asked. In the same way, in, the, in another garden, the garden, the very first garden, this here in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the first garden, the Garden of Eden, remember when Adam and Eve fell? Before they took of the tree, they would walk in the cool of the day with God. They would walk with God. But when they sinned, they hid themselves. The Lord cried out, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? God knew where he was. And it's not, oh, where are you, Adam? No, it was never like that. We always people interpret that way. God is disappointed. He's heartbroken. Adam, where are you? We used to walk. We used to walk every day. We had a relationship. We had a thing going. Why? Why? Why, Adam? Where are you? God knew what they did. God knew where they were. The question for Adam was to realize where he once was when they walked in the cool of the day and now where he is, where he is now after he has taken the fruit. You need to know where you are. And I think that's the same way. 
Adam is now separated from God. Sin separates us from God. And the same thing we study about why the father and son were separated. Because of sin, Jesus took our sins. He's separated from God because he's holy. And in the same way, now listen saints, this is for us. The same way, how many times we've sinned or about to sin against God. And you may not know it, but right then and there, that's when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. And ask you the question, where is your heart right now? Why are you thinking those thoughts? Why do you have that attitude? Do you really want to use those words against your brother and sister in Christ? That's, I don't know, that's how it is for me. The whole, it's, it's a way the Lord and the Holy Spirit speaks. Eddie, why did you do that? Or well, Eddie, you really want to do that? And then it's my wife. No, just kidding. It's the Holy Spirit. Most of the time, it's the Holy Spirit, but the Lord does use my wife. Really, it's always a question, what are you doing? Don't you know? Doesn't the word says this? See, the question gives you and me, as it gave Judas, the opportunity. That question is, okay, wait a minute, what are you doing? It's an opportunity then that we could rethink and repent and turn around and not do it. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit should be working in your life that way. If he's not working in your life in that way, then you need to get closer to the Lord. Because it's a scary thing when you have no convictions of sin. And you know, Christians could be so much Christians that they really just going through the flow, but they have no real relationship with God, and they're not in devotion and in prayer where they're having conviction about the things they're doing, knowing it's wrong. That's a problem. It's, you're getting close to being dead spiritually, and being dead spiritually is, is dangerous. But I love it because the same Holy Spirit I ask you the question is the same Holy Spirit, and hear this, is the same Holy Spirit that will help you go through it. It will help you go through it, not to do what you're doing. He asks you the question, okay, you're weak in this, Eddie, I'm going to help you. Here's the question. Think about what you're about to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. So listen, the temptation you have, you can't say nobody knows what that is. As a matter of fact, you can't say Jesus don't know what it is. Hebrews says he was tempted in all ways and all forms. He said, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able you can't say, oh, there's temptations come. No, it's the reason why it's taking over you is because you haven't fought it. You're not fighting. You haven't brought it to the Lord. You haven't quote scripture. But with the temptation, you will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You see, don't say this, oh, I can't, I can't, no. You can't in and of yourself, yes, but the, whole, the, the scripture says the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in. Think about that. I don't, th I don't think you're thinking. The Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the grave is in us. And I think we are not considering the Holy Spirit in our lives to help us. But here, that's what the question, Jesus asking Judas, why, why have you come? Verse 50, but Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Now John gives us a little bit more information here. Because it may seem like, okay, you know, they arrest him and that's it. John chapter 18, verses 4 to 8. It says this in verse 4, it says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things, he knows all things, again, it's not a surprise, that knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. I'm going to hold, hold that right there. You see, the reason why I purposely, because that's how it is in your Bible, that he is in italics because it is not an original manuscript. Jesus says, I am. They wanted Jesus. There's a lot of Jesus in Nazareth. 
There's a lot of Jesus in Jerusalem. Yeshua is a very common name. But you want Jesus of Nazareth. I know who you're talking, you're referring to, but whom are you seeking? I am. I am. In the original manuscript, it's just I am. There's no he. The translator thought they could help us out with this. But it takes away, actually. The I am is ego emini, which it, it's in the Greek. You remember when Moses was at the burning bush and the Lord appeared to him. And Moses wanted to know, okay, oy vey, what is his name? I don't know his name. What's his name? Bob, John, I don't know. What's his name? So, okay, I got to go to the Jew in Israel. They want to know. They don't trust me. They don't be, okay, go Lord. He said, Lord, what if the people ask me for your name? What should I tell them? What's your name? Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, it says, And God said to Moses, I am who I am. You could probably switch from that, yeah. We're going to go back to that. I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, to you and I today, Calvary Chapel Milford, I am has sent me to you. I am. Remember Jesus said to the Pharisees and the mob, they were just getting ready to stone them, and Jesus was preaching, preaching. In John chapter 8, verses 5 and 8, it says, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. That's important. The I am means self-existing one. The one who has always been, the one who has always is, and the one who will always be. I am is really not a noun, it's a verb. He is more than just a person. It is not a place or thing. He is. He is. You see, I love this I am title because it's as God would tell us, tell you and me, I am everything you need. I am your creator. I am your savior. I am your salvation. I am your refuge. I am your healer. I am your comforter. I am your helper. I am your friend. I am your provider. I am everything. You're all in all. I am. That's who he is. He's the existing one. Now back to John chapter 18 verse 5. It says, And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Verse 6. Now when he said to them, I am. You got the he there. I love this. They drew back and fell to the ground. Who are you, who are you seeking? Oh, Jesus of Nazareth. I am. Pfft. Domino effect. They all fell. I can imagine all the tin and all the spears. Oh, they all getting up and they collect themselves. And, and you know, what I love about it is that Jesus went to them. He saw them coming. He went to them. He wasn't afraid. Then in verse 7, it says, Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? They said Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus had to correct them again. It's not Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. <laughs> Jesus was no wimp. Back to Matthew chapter 20. So look at verse 51. Verse 51. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Now, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> you guessed it. Peter. I love Peter, man. I really do. Oh. John tells us in his gospel, yes, it was Peter. You're right. <laughs> Never give a fisherman a sword. <laughs> that's what he is, and that's the reality. Peter did say to the Lord, I will die with you. However, it's not so much die, it's you would deny. It's a difference. In fact, me personally, I think it's easy to say, I'm going to die for Christ. It's difficult to live for Christ. Every day of your life. Think about it. Jesus, come. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, take me home. <laughs> you know, end it all. You know, that's, that's, that's like a shortcut. Please, I had enough. I can't deal with it anymore. Yeah. It's easy to say I would die for Jesus. I know I, I, know I would. But what I need, the Holy Spirit, and I need God to bless me is to not, to not offend him. 
I would not deny him either. And here we could see, yeah, Peter, you got your sword. He probably thought Jesus was going to do something. <laughs> He's performed all kinds of miracles. He fed 5,000. You know, he walked on water, calmed the storm. You got to do something, Jesus. Don't the angels going to back you up here? John gives us the name of this temple guard. His name is Malchus. Luke tells us that his ear was healed in Luke chapter 22, verses 50 to 51. Luke writes this, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Jesus answered and said, permit even this, and he touched his ear and healed him. So put it back up. Put the ear back up on there. Verse 52, but Jesus said to Peter, said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. It's not that one has a sword, but one who commits an act of violence, one who commits murder to achieve their personal end. That is the problem. They will face punishment. There's nothing wrong. If we look at, we look at it today, there's nothing wrong with arms and firearms and not because you know, I have, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. They had swords. Disciples had swords. They didn't have swords to start carving crosses off trees. That's self-defense. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you do it for your own gain, for your own, to achieve your personal ends, then it's a problem. Genesis chapter nine, verse six, Jesus, the Lord says, whoever sheds man's blood by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. That applies to the unborn. That applies to abortion. Heaven and earth will pass, but his word would not pass. God doesn't make empty threats, he does it. He never, ever, ever made empty threat, because if he made an empty threat, he's not God. And for those who promote and vote for and have no problem with abortion, you know, there it is. That's your heart. You're against the word of God. That's not the heart of God. Verse 53, is, he's, the Lord said to Peter, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 leads of angels? I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, Peter's like say, yeah, that's what I did this for. Hello, get those angels down here. What's going on? We already know that a legion, now this is, you know, 12 legions, what's a legion? 6,000 times 12, that's 72,000. That's, overkill is an understatement, we cannot define that. I mean, the angelic host is, is innumerable, so that's not a number. But you only need, really, one. You remember, if you know your Bible, 2 Kings. Remember 2 Kings chapter 19 where one angel it said this here. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 158,000. Oh, I'm sorry, 85. Dyslexia kicks in every now and then. 185,000. And when the people rose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. That's it, one angel, 185,000. Do we really need 72,000? I don't think so. I don't think so. The reality is I don't think Jesus even needs any help. If he wanted to get out, he definitely would. He always disappeared, remember? And they wanted to get, where did he go? They wanted to throw him off the cliff, remember? Where did he go? The reality is, he doesn't need an angel because he created angels. He's more powerful than you. you. cannot create something more powerful than you. And that's the problem when we look at idols, statues. <laughs> you create a statue out of plastic, wood, has a mouth, can't speak, eyes can't see, ears, and that's greater than you, and you're depending on something you created with your hands. But God created angels. He, cast out a third of the angels and Lucifer himself. In all this, Jesus was teaching Peter, the bottom line, Peter, listen, put your sword away because this is not a battle with flesh and blood. This is way beyond, <laughs> you don't know. 
Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is the battle. When somebody is against you, it's not really them. It's the enemy. Verse 53, we're coming to 56, and we come to a close. He said, do you not think that I can now pray to my father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Verse 54, how then could the scripture be, scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitude, have you come out against me, against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching you in the temple that you did not seize me, and you did not seize me. Verse 56, but all this was done that the scripture of the prophets might be fulfilled. And it says there at the very end, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Exactly what Jesus said in verse 31. What did he say? Before Judas came, he said, all of you would be made to stumble because of me. And strike the shepherd, scatter the flock. This was all God's plan. He willingly gave him himself. The fact that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that Judas would, Judas would come to, for him, he still went. He willingly went to the cross. He had the power to lay it down. He has the power to raise it up again. Amen? Let us stand. Don't forget, I know you probably heard this over and over again. Pray for the election. Pray for our nation. Pray for peace. Pray that Christians become more bold. Get the opportunity to share the gospel. When the world is depending on a man or a candidate, say, listen, our hope and trust is in Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. You're the I am, the great I am. You are the bread of life. You are the resurrection. You are all in all. Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit has worked in each and every one of us. Lord, we know your word will never return back to you void. So we know that uh, has ministered to all of us. I know it has ministered to me. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray for this weekend. We pray for the coming election. We pray for our country, our nation. Lord, we pray ultimately that your church will rise up in the midst of this, regardless of the outcome of this election, that we will be the peacemakers. You said, blessed are the peacemakers. I pray that we are the ones that bring reconciliation between you and man. Use us, Lord, in these last days, not to be political, but to be biblical, to be Christians more than part of a party. We love you, Lord. We bless your name. In Jesus' name, and all God's saints say, Amen. God bless you. May the Lord be with you. Have a blessed week.